the WTA is a nonprofit trade association. We've been around since 1985, and we exist for two purposes. First is advocacy. We are here to advocate for the commercial interests of the independent tele teleport operator community around the world. And we do that because uh, by dealing with issues affecting all of them, we uh, help stimulate growth for their companies. At the same time, we promote excellence in teleport operations, business strategy, and technology uh, because that translates into high value to the customer and a profitable business operation for the teleport operators involved. Our topic today is uh, best practices in teleport valuation. This is a report that we published on the 29th of January um, with quite a, a great list of competitors, uh, but rather of contributors, um, who are in many cases competitors, uh, from companies that are serial acquirers of facilities to law firms to business brokers uh, and uh, advisors to transactions. So they had a great deal to say, and we look forward to sharing some of that with you. The focus of this really is for the teleport operator. So if you are a teleport operator who has worked long and hard to build a communications business, um, maybe you're in a position now where you need to finance expansion. Or perhaps you're looking at acquiring another satellite service provider outside your region. Or maybe it's time to sell that business and realize uh, the value of it after a lifetime of hard work. So whatever those requirements are, the first requirement is to set a value on the business. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and what you'll find is that that value may be different depending upon who you're having the conversation with. This uh, report, like all of our reports, is made possible by the financial support provided by an extraordinary set of companies. We call them the industry leaders. Uh, and you see them here on your screen, as well as industry patrons. And uh, they come from a broad cross-section of our business. All of them share a common interest in the work we do. And they uh, generously support that. So we're very, very grateful to them. Today, we're going to be talking about, in terms of valuing teleports, how to understand the, the assets that we're talking about, agreeing on their value, uh, a set of must-dos, things you have to do, and or mistakes that you need to avoid. And finally, uh, a conclusion to sum it all up for you. So understanding the assets, what is it that creates value? Turns out, according to the experts we talk to, there's four distinct things, and they're listed here in their order of importance. The first and foremost being the, uh, the value of the ongoing business that runs through that teleport. And there we see a very typical example on the screen, uh, a number of good-sized an uh, antennas, a lot of receive ownings that you can't even see because they're all behind those trailers and in front of the antennas. A uh, big building in the back where we house all of our electronics, our power conditioning, um, our data center, whatever it may be in there, our playout center. And the value, the biggest value it has is in terms of its ongoing business. Uh, another value is the land on which it sits, the terrestrial connectivity that reaches that particular facility sitting out there in the field. And finally, at the bottom of the list, the antennas, the electronics, the buildings, the fixtures, all the things you can see in the picture uh, do contribute value, but not in, not in uh, any proportion to their importance in the business. So let's talk about the ongoing business. Um, what does that mean? It means really the backlog of customer contracts, um, the a growth factor that a sensible buyer will bring into it. Um, over some period of time, that business is going to grow, uh, minus the operating expenses of the business. And voila, you do that, and you find out what kind of cash flow it's going to throw off. And uh, a financial financial analyst will tell you what that value is today, and that's the that's the value of the business. Except, of course, nothing is ever quite that simple in real life. Um, and here are some of the um, special conditions that can affect the perception of value or the measurement of value. Uh, the first and foremost is the customers. Uh, depending upon why this valuation is being done, that can make a, a great deal of difference. One. Um, serial acquirer we talked to said, for instance, that contracts with other service providers are not of much value to, to, to him and to his business. And of course, most teleports have a mix of contracts with end users, with other service providers, whether they are just pure play satellite operators or sometimes competitors. Um, and for this company, that's not really very valuable at all because those companies are likely to be competitors. So what they want for the most part are end users, except, and there's always an exception, um, the exception is in emerging market nations. Uh, there, they really like to see contracts through, done through local partners. Um, 
say they're acquiring a potentially acquiring a business in Africa, um, they want to see a set of small to mid-sized resellers who are finding the business, licensing the business, installing it, maintaining it for that teleport because that's the hardest thing to do in one of these countries. So that's a, a pretty nuanced question, and it's going to, the answer to it is going to be very different depending upon who you're talking with. Um, another factor is ancillary operations. Very few teleports are actually standalone transmission facilities. Most of them have other businesses. They may be um, systems integrators as well. They may be post-production or play-out companies. They may do custom manufacturing, software development. It's a very, very long list. And those parts of the business actually need to be valued differently than the core transmission business um, for a very simple reason. The assets in that case all go home at the end of the day. Um, so the business has more risk. Uh, your satellite antennas don't close, it's close down shop and go home to their families at the end of the day, but uh, the people who make most of these kinds of businesses I've talked about work do. And so if there's a buyer in this case, that buyer is going to have a good plan and have to understand that risk and have a strategy to retain those talented people who make, make a difference. But in the meantime, they have to, that part of that business needs to be valued at a lower multiple of that cash flow we talked about. Strategic fit. Um, the word, you, the phrase you hear a lot, but in, in the case of the teleport business, it really has to do, of course, with the integration into a global, a global operation. One uh, executive put it pretty succinctly. He said, if you're going to put assets together, they have to perform better than they would if they were apart. One plus one has to equal three, has to equal four. Otherwise, there's absolutely no point in, be, in doing it. And so that is going to significantly increase the value of a teleport business for some acquirers and going to make it much less valuable to others. And finally, one that actually surprised me a bit was the quality of the vendor contracts. Um, it turns out that companies that are going to put money into a business or potentially acquire it uh, care about the quality of the vendors. Are they name brand vendors? Uh, are, who do you have servicing your facility? Is it somebody reliable? Um, even are you using the same satellite uh, operators as an acquiring company? Because if so, there's some great opportunities there for consolidation of buying. So those are the kinds of, uh, the kinds of nuances that can affect what would otherwise be a straight, straight matter of arithmetic. The land, the land. There's not a great deal to say about it except for two things. One is many teleports were built in 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, in what were then fairly remote places uh, because they were frequency protected. And over time, what's happened, of course, is the urban areas have grown, have spread, and very often teleports are find themselves sitting on some extremely valuable land. Sometimes it's more valuable than anything else about the business. And so that should always be looked at separately. Uh, one broker described a, a situation in which he was asked to value a, a facility. And they looked at a picture of it and he said, well, I don't know what the value of it is, but I can tell you who's going to buy it. I said, who? He said, this the, uh, the farmer next door. And uh, as it turned out, nine months later, the teleport, which didn't have any business associated with it, so it was just a facility, did indeed sell and it sold to that farmer. That was a pretty good call. The other thing that's specific to teleports that's different about them is that unlike every other telecommunications business really you can think of, location matters a tremendous amount. Um, that's part of the, the reason that you use a teleport because it's in a specific place. So uh, one of our respondents said that the services are so dependent on where you perform them from that if you're going to buy that facility, or you have to make sure that the company either owns the land it sits on or it has a very, very long-term rental contract with very clear financial um, constraints in, in terms of how much that rent can go up. Uh, in, this, in this particular fellow's uh, estimation, and he's bought quite a few of these things, he said if, if those things don't exist, I wouldn't consider buying it. So that's something for both the owner and the acquirer to think about. Terrestrial connectivity. Um, one of our respondents noted that for quite some time, if you were in the teleport business, you spent most of your, your time thinking about the RF side of things. But that is certainly not the case anymore. Um, a teleport is valuable if it has robust fiber connections to all the major players in a region. Um, if you're at the center of that kind of network, that's tremendously valuable. Um, if the buyer, on the other hand, has to create that kind of connection, then that's going to really knock some, some money off the value of the property. Um, that 
routing, the, the, the fiber going into that has got to be really, really diverse. Uh, you, and of course, we all know the engineering drill, but it's really hard to make it actually happen. But buyers care, and investors, if they're smart, care about two fiber paths coming in from different sides of the property, two service providers whose uh, facilities are physically separate to all the way to the central office and so forth. Um, and if possible, I mean, the best of all possible worlds is you build your, you, you, you build your teleport right on top of an internet exchange, right on top of a POP, because if you can, if you can offer um, a buyer the opportunity to spend a heck of a lot less on local loop or new, co new contracts than somebody else, your, your teleport is going to be extremely competitive. The cost of the local loop has become a very large part of the, of the, uh, the play. And uh, not the long haul loop, of course, but the local loop. And that's going to make a big difference to the value of the property. And finally, we come to the rest. The antennas, the electronics, the building, the fixtures, all the stuff that, unfortunately, by itself is not worth that much. And it's not worth that much for a very straightforward reason. Of course, for the operator of the facility, the true value of those assets is actually what it costs to replace them. But for a buyer, for a lender, the, the value of that uh, stuff is what it would take, what it would uh, fetch on the resale market as used equipment. And of course, that's not a lot of money, um, which is why it's so difficult to sell a teleport facility that doesn't have any business associated with it. Uh, one of our serial acquirers said the only way you'd ever think of doing that, of selling a teleport just as a physical asset, is because you had to, and it would definitely be a distress sale. That said, those assets do have value. And the buyer or a lender, smart lender will work pretty hard to find out exactly what that is. And that comes down to all the stuff that makes a facility good in the first place. Um, rooms for fire safety, power conditioning, UPS generators, HVAC, raised floors, neat cabling, good cabinets professionally laid out, uh, maintenance logs, all those things um, that if you, were, if you were buying the teleport you'd want to see, well, those are important for the seller to, to have as well to get the maximum value out of out of those fixed assets. OK, so those are the basic, that's the basic outline of the assets themselves. The question is, what do you do about it? Um, that doesn't really tell you what the buyer or the lender is willing to offer and should be, should be able to pay. Those are determined by other things. Those are determined by their mission and by the conditions in the marketplace. And, and interestingly enough, there's two completely different views of it. Uh, if you're talking to a lender, if somebody wants, is, if you need to borrow against the value of the business as it is, the lender is going to take a very particular look at it. The lender is going to look at that your business and say, how small can it get in the worst possible circumstance? Um, specifically, if you've got, let's say you've got a contract that's got six months left to run on it, for a lender, that's a high risk. For an operator, you look at it and go, oh, I, that, that contract isn't going anywhere. I'm going to renew that with no problem because the service is good and it's very difficult to relocate this kind of business. But for a banker, that's, that's a clear sign of danger. Um, that's where the value of a track record comes in. If you have borrowed, borrowed money and paid it back before a couple times, um, you're in a much better position. One of, the, one of the companies we talked to talked about having gone to the debt markets multiple times in the last few years. And the first time it was really, really hard. And the second time it was easier. And the third time after that it was easier still because they developed a track record at borrowing a lot of money, paying it all back, and making sure that the lenders got their full profit. And that's the kind of track record you need to succeed. If you're valuing it for purchase or sale, however, it becomes a completely different thing. In that case, the buyer um, or the investor is looking at the long-term cash flow that can come out of that business. And now we're, now we're really cooking. Now we're in a place where we can get some value for the facility. The way to get to the right value is very straightforward. You've got to have an investment advisor who brings knowledge to, to, the, to the transaction. And that knowledge specifically is of comparable transactions. It's really the only thing that anybody wants to know about is what have similar facilities sold for under similar circumstances. Because it's, that, it's those kind of uh, calculations that are going to be used to adjust that discounted cash flow model and tell you whether um, you're gonna, we're going to pay um, three times uh, your, your discounted cash flow two times, one time, four times. Um, so the value of that advisor is enormous. And it was just over and over again, it's stated, you need to have somebody you trust, and you need to have somebody um, 
in your corner to, to get you through this process. There are a couple pitfalls here in terms of the valuation that need to be pointed out. One is on the seller's side, if this is that kind of transaction. Um, and that is, and this came from many, many places, sellers very often have what buyers are going to cons consider to be unrealistic expectations. Um, they may have spent years or decades building a business. It has enormous value in their minds, but that doesn't tell you anything about how the market values it. Uh, one respondent said that in the industry lately, we've seen some deals done at very high valuations, uh, single or even double digits, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, eight, ten times the, the EBITDA. Um, so, you know, that's for companies with, that are big, that have good contracts, that have professional leadership. So he said owners see that and think that their small company can be sold for the same high multiple, and it just isn't going to happen. So that's one of the places where a professional advisor is really, really useful at showing the reality in the marketplace. For buyers, the pitfall is, on the other side, it's lack of knowledge. They can never know as much about the business as the seller is going to know. And so most of the effort they put into it is trying to reduce that area of the unknown. It's ironic, isn't it, that the equipment, all the stuff you can see, is a relatively little makes relatively little contribution to the value. Um, so the buyer has to constantly be trying to figure out the value of intangible things, of, un, of, of invisible things. Uh, one, one broker described a situation he'd seen. He said, sometimes people sell because they've pissed off their customers and they know the business is going to tail off. They're not going to get the contract renewals that they, they'd like to get. So they have a motive to get to sell that facility and to sell it now and to saddle somebody else with the problems. Those that, that's the kind of thing that keeps buyers awake at night. So we've opened up one of the mistakes that can be made. Let's talk about some more. Um, we'll talk about this on, from, again, both sides, the seller's side and the buyer's side of a transaction. And the seller's side, we were cautioned in several places about the, the peril of overpricing of a seller saying, here's my number, I have to have this number. One broker said he advises sellers very seriously to never put an asking price on the table. Let the buyer do it. Let's, let's find out. You know what that and find out try to find out what that asking price is based on. It gets you to a much more realistic, productive discussion a lot faster. And of course, you could say, well, what's the problem? I'm you know going to state a price, and if I don't get it, I'll negotiate down. But that actually can can, can carry some risks, according to a couple of people we talked to. Um, you know, the owner wants to recoup his investment. You know, her investment uh, owner asks for some a big number and sticks there. And in the end, here's the danger. The danger can be that that price doesn't get, the facility doesn't sell for that price, the owner still wants to, to monetize the, the facility and the business and get out, and so he or she ends up doing it in the worst possible way, which is to get a broker to come in, break up the facility, and basically sell it for parts, sell it for pieces, used equipment, and what you get is the worst possible price. So it pays to be savvy about, about uh, this particular aspect. The other thing it pays very well is to be very well prepared quite some time in advance to make that facility and that business as valuable as possible. Um, so one way to do that would be, for instance, to, um, as your contract renewals come up, try to get them to be as long as possible and grow the size of your backlog. Another is that uh, there may be some consolidation opportunities available to a business, some small companies that it may want to pick up, each one of which could, uh, could add to its total revenues as well as increasing its asset base. And that, that can become a, a powerful contributor to value. Um, one media executive had a, a different uh, suggestion for an investment, which I personally like very much. He said, you know, another thing you can do that doesn't really cost very much money is to just become extremely visible. Work on building your image or your reputation. Go to the trade shows, join association boards, sit on panels. Build the perception that you are a leader in the business. Um, why? Well, because what you're doing in doing that is you're creating a very strong impression that your business has strong and competent management, and that's going to make you more attractive to buyers. You're going to hopefully get into a position where you've got multiple companies bidding on you. Another uh, great piece of advice is about homework. Um, if The more homework that the seller does, the higher the valuation of the facility is likely to be, and the smoother the deal is likely to go. Um, and that can be very hard because entrepreneurs in particular may have spent years or decades building a business. Attending to documentation, to paperwork has never been a priority, but this is the time when it becomes a priority. So we advise strongly um, 
three to five years of audited financial records. Um, yes, it's a pain in the neck, and yes, it costs money, but it really, really makes it, it gives a lot of comfort to the buyer. Um, and it really helps the company sell at a better price. Uh, and along with that documentation, there's the operational documentation. You need to be able to prove to the buyer that all the equipment you, that, that's going to change hands has been really well maintained over a long period of time and in a lot of detail. So yet another piece of documentation that has to be in place. One, uh, one an attorney just said, you know, go ahead, do it the way that the do it the way the big boys do it. Set up a deal room. Make sure you have all your financials, all your customer contracts, your leases, supplier contracts, loan documents, everything, in one place, and so that buyers can potential buyers can come and look at it. He also said, however, be careful you let in there. And I heard this from several places uh, when we were doing the interviews. You have to make sure that the prospective buyer you're dealing with actually is a buyer, because you're going to get the competitors or potential competitors coming in to see what they can learn. And so while you're being cagey about who you let in, into that, that deal room, one very serious piece of advice was to never, ever hide problems. If your facility has problems, and almost every facility does, every business does, due diligence is going to find it. And when it does, what will have happened is that the most valuable asset in that entire negotiation, which is trust, will have been damaged. And the more that the buyer trusts, the more comfortable that buyer is going to be that the risks are manageable. And when you damage that trust, you've really done some damage to yourself. Expect to stick around. Uh, very few buyers want to see the manager of a successful business they're, they're buying go away. Uh, one of them said, we require a three-year relationship after the transaction. Um, success is based upon that work of that team, the work of, of some of the key leaders. The last thing we want to do is see them go away right, right away. And finally, and this, this is really the flip side of the homework, um, do your own due diligence. Uh, it is entirely possible to sell your facility to a buyer who really can't afford it uh, or who can get the money to pay some of it but not all of it and, and so forth and so on. So if you're accepting installment payments, which is, again, a very typical way, there's usually to pay out over time, you become a, uh, you, you become a lender to that, that uh, new operator and that means you're face all the risk that a lender normally normally faces. So you need to find out who you're dealing with on the other side. For buyers, the list is a little shorter, but, but quite profound. And the first and foremost one on it is due diligence. Due diligence. You can never, ever, ever do enough of it, is what we were told. Eventually you stop, but you can never do enough. Um, and what that means is looking at uh, the underlying contracts, judging the company's ability to perform in those contracts, judging the SLAs, the service level agreement compliance, how good is that? Look at the satellite capacity contracts. Are, are, is this business going to be exposed to capacity that it can't resell? Um, is there potential, you know, how, how risky are some of the contracts? And on and on and on and on. Um, that's why it's so difficult to hide anything, because a buyer uh, is going to work very hard at finding out everything that they're, they're ultimately going to potentially be stuck with. And that includes uh, who the customers are. Uh, one broker said, you know, it's kind of awkward to call up a business, call up the customers of a seller and ask them a bunch of tough questions, but you absolutely should do that. Um, and the same is true of all the equipment. You have to understand the hours it's been run, its age, how it's been maintained. Um, one tech uh, chief technology officer had a great phrase. He said, all the parts and the components in this facility are going to need to talk to each other very, very reliably. That's what determines how good the facility is. I need to be able to confirm that they can do that. Connectivity, that terrestrial connectivity, always worth drilling into a lot harder than you might want to. Uh, a great story from another buyer. He said that they bought a facility uh, which had redundant uh, uh, fiber going now two sides of the of the property, two different carriers who had two different central offices, and, and everything looked great until there was a fire in a train tunnel. And it just so happened that for a very short uh, distance, the the fiber ran, both carriers ran through that same tunnel, completely wiped out the fiber connectivity for them. So uh, it's very hard to it's very hard to ever finish investigating that, but it's, it can be extremely important to the value of the business. Interesting advice from a media executive who said buyers sometimes make an interesting mistake. They they buy a facility and then they think they can cut their way to profitability, uh, and sometimes that's a plan, and other times it's just. It turns out that they borrowed more money than they should have. They've got to get a lot more cash out of the facility than they thought had, so they start making cuts. And he says, and it never, ever, ever works. 
They cut, they cut the headcount, morale sinks, the company loses value. He compared it to buying a Ferrari and kicking the doors in on the first day, just to you know, show how tough you really are. And finally, the contract. It's all going to come down to the contract. Uh, that purchase contract needs to have lots of protections in it. Um, an attorney suggested a simple hold back part of the business prices kept in escrow until you had a chance to run the business for a while and understand it. Um, the usual payout upon performance and so forth and so on. These are these are serious things that have to. After all that other work, um, the advice was don't stint on on that purchase contract. It can make a huge amount of difference going forward. So, what is a teleport really worth? Uh, I thought I'd. I'd finish by uh, quoting from one of the respondents who had a great answer to this. He said he recently had done a valuation project for a teleport business, and actually in this particular project used all three of the approaches that you could use. The first one was just to value the physical assets, most conservative, least generous view of their resale value, not much of a number. The second was a runoff scenario. The idea was that you, you, you can buy the business, yet you don't really think it's going to go anywhere. You don't think it has growth potential. So instead, you're going to buy the business. You're going to fire everybody who isn't needed to run today's business because you're not planning to get any more business in that facility. And you're going to try to milk those contracts for everything that they're worth. And when the revenue is gone, you liquidate the business. A low risk proposition. The contracts are already exist. Um, I don't, it's not particularly a great way to do business. And you're certainly not going to get much of a reputation in the business doing that, but it can be done. And the least conservative and the most reasonable way is to value the thing as an ongoing concern. What is the value of its brand, its people, its ability to win new contracts, as evidenced by the ability of the, by the track record of winning them in the past, um, the, the economic environment the company's operating in, who the competitors are, a, a real live growing business. So those are the three different views you can take of a teleport property when it's being valued. And what it's really worth depends upon which of those views you take and who you are, whether you are a buyer who wants to run it, whether you're an investor, whether you're a bank. So that's a short walk around a complex issue, but it can be a great way to get started with uh, this very complex topic. I thank you very much for joining us.